There we go. Great. So uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome again to another Agility Leadership Network meetup session uh, titled Visualize Your Agile Strategy and See Your Roadmaps and Context. Tonight, we've got the amazing Craig Coburn, who's been working with Agile Practices for over 10 years. He is originally a software engineer, holds a software degree from Edinburgh University and Napier University, um, and is based in Edinburgh, where you work as a freelance Co agile coach is that still true Craig because you work in yeah. with Wales isn't yeah yeah it? so that's all remote I just live here okay. right? and I work here now as well great so uh, you're an active member of the agile community founding member of the BCS agile specialist group and also helps to support agile community events in Scotland um, you've you've had a whole number of roles over the years haven't you scrum master development yeah. lead agile coach etc and tonight we give him a very warm welcome to share his expertise with us on visualizing our ag agile strategy and roadmaps and context so without further ado Craig over to you thanks Okay, well, thanks, Ashley, and um, yeah, it was nice to chat to you and uh, Giles earlier, so uh, welcome to everybody, it's nice to see a good turnout, I know that with everything going online, we've got lots of competition with events all over the world now, uh, but if I just uh, share my screen to, uh, if you just put that on so you can see that, uh, everything's now just moved around, uh, move it back, so can you, you see that okay, and you can hear me fine? Yep, all good. Right, so I will kick that off as well. Right, so this is a uh, talk, uh, strategy and roadmaps and context. And a little bit about me, uh, I did just to what Ashley said. Uh, my name is Craig Coburn. I am very distantly related to Agile Alistair, who um, wrote the Agile Manifesto. Um, and I'm available on Twitter and there's a hashtag for the event. And that's my LinkedIn page there. So feel free to connect, ask me questions afterwards if I don't have time. And um, uh, thanks for attending. So just to kick off, um, the audience, really, the, I, I think that st strategy is uh, important for everybody. It's not just for senior leaders. It's for people that create the strategy or look at the strategy or implement any part of a strategy or even coach. So really, I think a bit like quality or being interested in customers, it's not just the sort of privilege of the people at the top. The more people that have an interest in it, um, the more feedback and perspectives we get. And also you can use strategy within a team context as well as an organizational context. If you think about something like even a sprint plan, that's your strategy for successfully delivering the sprint goals at the end of the sprint. So that's a type of simple strategy. And of course, if we get things wrong, it can be disastrous for the company as I will come on to in a minute. So strategy really does matter for all of us, like quality and being interested in what customers want. So this is broadly the uh, layout of the talk. There's about seven big sections. Here I'll cover the journey of what strategy is and why it's important. Take you through quite a complex example um, because uh, it was from the inspiration of, of that that uh, led me to this. And somebody had done a lot of work and went, oh, that's a useful practice. But then I'll simplify it down to give you a really simple example and talk you through that, as well as some takeaways and templates. So there's lots of things there and some further reading. Um, that's your typical, how does a talk work in seven steps? But I use this visual format as well, which is another talk that I give, because a lot of people, particularly those in the neurodiverse spectrum, have said that the visual format works better for them. And so that's the format here. It's, um, it's color coded. And the width of the bars roughly indicates roughly how long I spend talking about those areas. And then when you play back the talk on YouTube, you can then go to those parts quickly because that part corresponds to the color. So you can find it quicker. But the, uh, the backstory here was uh, I was working in some teams and um, separately going to agile meetups. I went to see Roman Pischler talk and he was very good. I went to see Simon Wardney talk and he was very good. Uh, I enjoyed them both immensely. Um, however, the teams that I was working with said, well, that stuff and Simon Ward was talking about, really good talk, but I just can't see how I can relate it to my context, because a lot of it is about either technology, value streams, and, you know, whilst useful and interesting, it doesn't have time scales on it. I don't know where to start, and I don't know what difference it would make if I started there or there, so I can't really see how I can get a plan from it. 
Um, and so I took the, the information from Roman Pitchflower and started to combine these together a little bit into an early blog article, which is if you have a Wardley map, which is really good for strategy, how would you then take that to start forming backlogs and teams from it? That article got a fair bit of feedback. So I went, well, that, that seems to be a, a useful thing that people are interested in. So I then took it from there and that's, that's how this talk developed. But I use a bit of Simon Wardley's content. So if you've seen his talks, you may recognize it. Um, but first of all, I've just uh, an interest to why maps matter. Um, this is uh, again from Simon Wardley. He uses this example of the Battle of Thermopylae, which was immortalized in the film 300. And your typical strategy might be be the leading army or win three battles or expand territory and so on and so on. And, and there's a SWOT chart down there about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, which is all very well and very interesting, but doesn't really tell you what to do or how to do it or why. Whereas the map on the left shows that by effectively blocking the sea, it then forces the um, enemy to fight on land. On land, there was a narrow strait at Thermopylae and that was advantageous to force them there because they were very large in number. And if they fought on a narrow front, it would diminish that advantage. So therefore that is why that strategy was quite useful there. And effectively this strategy played out, delayed to their invasion and um, you know, proved useful in, in the longer term. Now, although that battle was slightly inconclusive, but had positive benefits, um, a more realistic example for me was uh, this one in Bannockburn, which uh, Scotland is still talking about 700 years later. Um, but the, the particular relevance here is, first of all, the, the Scottish army was much smaller than the English army. So the odds were really stacked against them. Uh, the English army at that point was the dominant military force, and yet they lost. And also it was only a two day battle. Now, so this shows that strategy isn't just for big, complex, long lasting multi-year things. If it's two days and it's effective, you can have a result that is remembered many years after the fact. And their strategy basically played to the advantage of the landscape and the traps, uh, helped to diminish the effectiveness of the superior English numbers by forcing them to fight in a narrow front again. And so the strategy there I've laid out in six steps, but, but the, the outcome of all this was the strategy helped them to win, even though the numbers were against them. So effective tactics really turned that situation around and um, led to a, a, a very famous victory that then led to Scotland being recognized as independent uh, for many years afterwards. So, and, and also uh, interesting by way of comparison, uh, the Agile Manifesto only took two days to write as well and look at the effect that's had. So a two day event can, can really have really long lasting consequences. Again, it's about thinking small and being effective. So this is the talk. I said I'd use a color coded format. So I've just done this intro part of it and given you a bit of context about uh, where it came from. And I'm now going to move on to the problem statement. First thing, and as I said, I was in a, an organization when this was going on and people didn't quite get strategy, is that one of the problems they had was that in Agile we're talking about outcomes. I was there coaching them around outcomes. I said, well, these are, this is what outcomes mean. And they would then go to a board for approval for finance, and that board would say, those aren't outcomes. Then I looked up in the intranet, what is your definition of an outcome? And I looked it up and it made no sense at all and contradicted itself. So I said, well, no wonder there's confusion here. So one of the things is if you've got corporate jargon, um, you know, put it out there and, and try as much as possible to agree the same terminology within your organizations. So for the purposes of this talk, those are the definitions that I use. Um, so we're all on the same page. Now, they're hopefully not a million miles away from what you expect them to mean. But, but really, I think the purpose here is to say strategy is coherent. It fits together and makes sense. It's contextual. It, it's situational. It's, it's not just copied from somewhere else with a, a wishful thinking that it's going to work. And, and it delivers long-lasting outcomes. These outcomes support your end state or vision that you're trying to move towards. Uh, and that's the direction of travel. And tactics are what you do to implement the strategy. So these are how these things fit together. You may also have heard other terminology that's in the same area. So um, 
what I'm doing here is just trying to relate how things kind of kind of pile up and stack up. Um, you can also um, you measure progress by key results, OKRs. They're more of a measurement and forward planning approach, which is very useful. I, I, I like it a great deal. However, it doesn't necessarily show kind of optionality or different pathways or what your opponents might do, which is where the strategy map thing comes into play. Um, a famous quote that I um, was often hearing at meetups about culture eating strategy for breakfast, um, uh, quoted to Peter Drucker. So just before I get going, I'll just uh, debunk some myths about that particular quote. Um, he didn't actually say it. Um, it's one of those um, misquotes that's been handed down over the years, and I gave my sources there. I mean, again, the slide decks will be shared afterwards. You can click the links and follow them if you want. Um, but actually, the quote investigator said, well, we believe that this started from an earlier quote about um, culture beat strategy, and then it became culture eat strategy and then eat strategy of breakfast. And it was actually misattributed to him retrospectively. So again, a lot of this, these mistakes in business are about cutting and pasting. And I'm saying, just be careful of that. You, know, you, you, might, you might fall into a trap there. Um, so let's um, start thinking on the ground and making context-driven decisions. Um, another um, example, I've just moved on to here again, yes. Uh, avoid the seventh sense of, of cargo cult, which is copying everyone else and hoping it's going to work. Now, um, that bridge uh, in the sea, which looks a bit ridiculous, uh, so even this bridge has context, and it does, because um, the tide takes about six hours to come in, and um, so it's about a 12-hour cycle. For about four hours, that bridge is in the sea. For the other eight hours, it's not, because it's it's on a tidal estuary. And the reason there's a bridge there is that at low tide, you see there's a river. And so for about two-thirds of the time, the bridge serves a useful function by allowing you to get from the car park on this side to the big beach that you can't see on the other side. The other one-third of the time, well, it's just too high. But for two-thirds of the time, it serves a useful purpose. Um, and there's actually quite a deep channel under that bridge, so it's actually pointing at that out as well. Um, but, but the reason I show that example is that something that you, looks useless can actually have a quite a useful purpose when you know the context. And the other way around also applies. Something that might look quite useful can be useless in the wrong context too. So a, a few tales of strategic failure. Now, of course, you've maybe heard these examples before, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll drag up the old uh, Kodak blockbuster Nokia type examples. They are, they are sort of um, classic examples of strategic failure, but I, I raise them because actually the markets that we're in still exist, because we're still, have cameras, watch films, buy phones, and buy toys. So therefore, the market didn't really go away. The market might have changed a little bit. It might go into more digital and online, but largely it wasn't like they were selling fax machines and suddenly the market dried up. Or, um, you know, that it was essentially that there was a, a, a disruption. Um, Kodak, I think, invented the digital camera and wanted to protect that revenue. It didn't realize that there were greater forces at work, and that was digital cameras they didn't control the entire market. And so this over control of a particular part of the landscape um, led to the downfall. Same with Blockbuster, they felt they controlled things. They didn't perceive Netflix to be a competitor. Therefore, that narrow thinking, not realizing the effects of things that are outside your control led to them being disrupted out of business. So poor strategy. And their strategy was one of optimism and thinking that they had more control of the market than they really did. Um, rather than trying to look ahead and saying, well, what could be the consequence if we stay with the strategy? What's the first order and second order effects? And is that in our favour? Like we see this with actual, the back to work um, approach by bosses. They're not really thinking through, if we mandate people come back to the office and they've had a taste of working from home successfully, for some people, right? And it doesn't work for everybody, but for a large number of people, it does work. But they're not thinking through what's the second and third order effects of forcing people back in and how could that play out against competitors that allow choice right because this is about saying how can you be a customer setting organization if you're taking choice away so these examples are about poor strategy now 
I, I just put in a footnote there about actually knocking me respirators for 60 years, which in the time of COVID might have been quite useful, but they'd already been disrupted out of that line of work. It's funny how that, they're an organisation that's still actually in business. They, they now make a lot of back-end telephony equipment that use, they use by telecoms companies, but you just don't see them on high street as much. So they are very good at pivoting, uh, but sometimes that pivot's forced on them. Um, now, I will talk about Brexit now. I know this is perhaps a little bit old hat because Brexit is kind of somewhat done and dusted to a large degree. But when I wrote this talk, it was very much a live issue. And it was Brexit was kind of the inspiration for this talk because everybody was just confused and in a mess. And uh, this is the, the, the waterfall example of the landscape has changed and so have people's needs, but you still plow on regardless. Um, and, and there didn't seem to actually be a strategy either. But um, back to some real data here. So I like to quote actual data from natural surveys. Um, this is 97% um, of 10,000 executives said it was actually the most critical leadership behavior to success. As I touched earlier, if you get it wrong, it's likely to put you out of business. And 97% of executives think that's the case, that strategy is actually critical. Um, that study is uh, from Harvard Business Review and there's more data in Forbes at the bottom there. But the reality now of oh, this is going back three years, you see what happens, right? So this is the reality from the uh, Business Agility Institute. Uh, and this is from 2018. Again, quoting similar things that uh, leadership is the biggest challenge to agility and the leader sets the tone for the entire organization. But related to strategy, that it's unclear and changing vision, you know, and confusion and not really saying, well, this is what we're doing and why. This is one of the challenges that, that surveys are indicating is actually the biggest problem. And you see this is from 2018. So I've just uh, fast forward slightly to 2019. You can see that nothing's actually changed. It's exactly the same quote. So nothing changed in a year. And then we go to 2020 and, oh yeah, well, it's the same quote, but it's just be reworded slightly. And again, we know this is a big problem. We know 97% of executives say it's important, but really nothing is actually changing year on year. And again, it's about leadership style, culture, lack of vision, um, alignment. All these things are kind of adding up to the, the big picture of what's going on here. And again, a clash at the bottom there between leadership styles and culture, which particularly, you know, the culture of remote working is actually now clashing with some of the leader expectations of back to the office. So again, we see this leadership is not really quite in line with the broader landscape or the broader office, and all of these services were, of course, prior to COVID, which brought its own changes. Now, just, just to kind of bring that to a conclusion, I did some research from different places, like version one, the State of Agile report, uh, various consulting groups, con coaches, newspaper articles, attended companies, and again, I was seeing much the same thing myself, which I then wrote up in that Agile Failure Patterns article at the link. Probably the same what I've seen before. But it's nice to do your own research and draw from your own sources too. Uh, so that's kind of like the problem statement of we're not very good at strategy uh, and there's failures arising from that. And uh, there's a lot of, bit of maybe a bit of cut and paste. And often you see a strategic paper sits on a PowerPoint deck for five years, doesn't change and doesn't really even say very much. It's just like contemporary techno jargon about you know, trendy technologies and being adaptive and customer centric. And it doesn't say enough about what you really need to do. So uh, strategy and agile. There's, there's two things in the chat, which I can't see. Is there anybody wanting to say anything just now? No questions as yet, Craig. Okay, so, so just play just on. Just chat. Uh, so I, very much a touch on safe. I did give this talk uh, about a year ago to the safe group. And I thought I brought this in just largely for their benefit, but I've kept it in. Because in the safe books, um, in Scaled Agile Framework site, like they quote from uh, Escape Velocity. And, and again, they are also seeing the same problem. So again, it's about cross purposes. Nobody really knows what they mean. I touched on common language earlier. And um, you know, the, the, there's, there's just different answers to the same thing, but your organization's life depends on this. Um, it's pure discipline. And this is again quoted uh, on the Scared Agile Framework site and in the book. 
No, uh, just touch slightly on safe. The reason I actually mentioned safe, I'm not here to have a go at scaled agile. I know it's a, a slightly divisive topic sometimes, but I mention it because unlike a lot of the other frameworks and approaches, it's quite deep, rich, and aimed at the whole organization. So it's very much a top to bottom, you know, C-suite to the uh, Scrum teams type of an approach. But even safe doesn't actually talk about strategy very much other than just saying, well, we need to change. Um, yeah, well, okay, tell me something I don't know. And uh, it's also got two values around transparency and alignment, which is great to have those as values, but we actually see from that data before that people aren't aligned. So there's, there's talk about it, but there isn't really any key solutions. Uh, and, and here's a diagram that they did, which is nice. It's got a, a, a map that's waving between some road cones. So um, I guess that's going to help you with your strategy. But it does just remind us that we need to be adaptive and what it is, but not really telling us how to fix the problems. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, but hopefully this will help a little bit as I take you through the talk so you can see my thinking. Um, I also mentioned before I'd been to Roman Pischler's talk and he talks about strategy too. So just to kind of bring you in to see how it fits together there. Um, the This is from Roman. And, and the top bit shows that if you've got a vision, it can support your business strategy, which then helps you to implement a product strategy. And also the vision informs your product vision, which again also informs the product strategy. So there's a, there's a certain level of connectedness from top to bottom there. And that vision of your product informs your product strategy which is kind of where you see the product going longer, very much longer term plans. But that then allows you to then shape the roadmap, which is the nearer term timescales, perhaps six to 12 months. And then from that nearer term timescales and key things like features or um, you know, changing um, uh, key business metrics, you can then say, well, of that near term roadmap you know, uh, release, what then is the, road, the backlog items we need to be working on now? So therefore, your backlog is informed by your roadmap, which helps to deliver the strategy, which helps to realize the vision. So again, there's a, there should be a connectedness from top to bottom there. And again, frameworks like OKRs can certainly support this to bring about the alignment as well. So you can see, is the backlog being delivered affecting the things higher up in the right way? Um, but back now to Simon Wardley. So I'll bring these two together eventually, but he, he has a strategy cycle. Now, this is um, it's quite a complex diagram, but it's also it's from Sun Tzu's uh, uh, The Art of War. It also relates to John Boyd, who was a fighter pilot after World War II. He worked for the US um, uh, Air Force between 45 and 75. And it, it's about purpose first, which is imagine this is chess, right? Purpose would be, why play this at all? Now, you might like enjoy the game, you might want to be competitive, you might um, you know, feel like there's a career in it. So there's some driving why of purpose, like Simon Sinek start, start with why. Why bother at all? Right? But now you've actually committed to play and you've just made that decision and you've sorted out your why of purpose. You're now in a game, the board is before you and every move is context sensitive. So that's the why of movement. So there's two why's, why purpose, why bother at all? Why of movement? why this move now? And to get the why of movement, you kind of work through the cycle of understanding the landscape, the climate, apply doctrine principles, and then use leadership. Now, there's a lot to this. I'm only summarizing it here because there's lots of information out there already on, on, on the um, OODA loop and the strategy cycle. I'm only just going to touch on it a little bit here to give you a bit of context. Um, Craig, before we move on, just a quick one from Femi. Sorry, Femi, yeah. I'm going to ask uh -huh. on your behalf. Um, is the OODA loop the same as PD, uh, the Plan Do Check Act? Um, they are sort of similar, yeah. So the, the Plan Do Check Act, they're both sort of feedback cycles. I think, though, that there's slightly more to this because it differentiates things like landscape and climate. Uh, but again, they are, they are sort of feedback loops. Um, so there's a certain similarity. Um, of just doing something and seeing the effect. But the Plan Do Check Act, I'm, I'm gonna sort of wonder sometimes if it, if it starts to look far enough ahead and incorporate the practices in a, in a more explicit way. So it's still useful. Uh, this is perhaps a slightly more 
uh, a deeper way of looking at it. Uh, John Boyd uses the Uda loop, which is Orient, Observe, Decide and Act. And he said that basically if you're two fighters in the air having a dogfight, the one that can work through the mechanics of the Uda loop quicker can then get into position better and then will then ultimately win. Um, this is a different way of looking at it. There's a lot of detail on the slide, so I won't bore you with it, but it's like if you take the slide away, you can, you can read that. But it's applying where you might use that cycle, what you might do at different stages about situational awareness and doctrine is things like, you know, the, uh, the tactics that you might use and to, the things that remove duplication and understand uh, different uh, economic patterns, which is why I sort of mentioned as well about working from home. There's broader economic patterns about who prefers working from home that could influence who's ultimately successful in the work from home market or the back to the office market. And it was economic patterns as well that led Amazon to succeed over bookshops, even though if you'd ask people in the early nineties, what was a better experience, they would probably have said bookshops because you're meeting people, it's face to face, there's coffee, you can talk to people, you can handle the merchandise, you can see it right there and then you don't have to wait, it doesn't get lost in the post. Loads of things about that being better, but the economics prevailed. And this is really key to understand what are the different levers affecting where you work and why. So you don't just control your little bit, but you're actually subject to bigger forces outside your control. If you can affect the economic levers by making someone else's business uneconomic, no matter how many people want that business, it's less likely to succeed. So though we're very, very interested in what customers want, if you can make another business uneconomic, then even if customers want it, that business might not be there. So what's often missing in decks that I've seen, which are sadly decks, they're PowerPoint decks that don't change for five years. Sometimes I do surveys in these actual talks and I ask people, look, is it just me? Or is that happening in your case? And yeah, no, it, it's not just me. Uh, often this is the case. And sometimes strategies do get updated clearly with COVID that we've been through. Uh, a change, but broadly we see organisations not changing the strategies an awful lot and uh, not really kind of updating them when they learn something new. We often see a pattern of a new chief executive comes in, builds a strategy, not the strategy until they leave. Right? Um, and wh when it's a strategy, it's often about things like technology or position and market, but it misses out the people aspect. And we see from patterns that actually, if you don't bring people on that journey, they lose interest, become disinterested. And there's a lot of research that shows that when you tell people a compelling story, rather than just saying, do this, they actually learn it better, they understand it better, they, they relate to it better. And I mentioned here about the Agile Manifesto, two of the values in the Agile Manifesto are about people. And, and typically that people element is lost in the company strategy. They say things like, we're a people-oriented company, but they don't really actually live up to their values quite in line with the level of importance that it needs. So I, I just observe that these things are often missing. Um, and to, just to sort of, again go off with someone else's content, this is from me and McLaren Wallace's uh, one, um, the Excellent Innovation and Business Psychology Award. And what it shows across these 12 arcs is how we learn uh, and process information. So things can be existing or emerging or evolving. Things can be unknown or known. Things can be unfamiliar or familiar. So when things are changing around us, it's not only that they've changed, but our, no our knowledge of that might be novel. Therefore, in order to act, we need to process that knowledge, learn, assimilate it, and then become confident with it. So actually our internal capability of being able to act decisively is always lagging slightly behind because we need to become quite competent at that knowledge in order to implement it. And this is just a reflection of the human condition, such that we're not AI, we're not robots. And, and that comprehension, and then becoming confident, because leaders always want to be confident. They want to know what they're doing and be confident with that. And this emergence of knowledge to form a model that works for them is really important. Um, so now kind of walking through um, the whole the whole Brexit thing. If I apply that Udo loop to Brexit, you'll see, so the why of purpose, I mean, I don't really know in the minds of people that were motivated by this, there could be lots of different motives, but in order to understand 
um, a, a conflicting situation, it's always good to try and understand it from the other person's point of view, see it from their point of view and what their drivers might be. It gives you a good way of understanding what they might do next and what's actually making them act in a particular way. So that underlying motive is quite useful to understand. Um, somebody might have just had a financial aim and said, like, I'm just going to short the stock market. Yeah, we don't know, right? But um, the, this, this backstory is always useful to get the context. Moving on to what was then the landscape. This was a couple of years ago. Uh, Theresa May was still Prime Minister. There were competing groups. Uh, those groups were fractured sufficiently that the government lost its majority. Uh, there was people saying things in public and doing things in private. There was people not willing to compromise. There was lots at stake. There was no real pre precedent to refer to. It was quite a, a messy place, but that was the landscape. These things didn't really change much, like like the landscape, you just more or less had to accept it. However, there are certain elements that were changing. And th these were the important things that could then prevail over the landscape. So this is climate. Right? So cl climactic patterns a couple of years ago, again, was that the clock was running down, the situation was changing, we were running out of time, the government had a majority and then lost it. There was legal action, which um, uh, there was an MP brought a case before the Supreme Court, Parliament was prorogued, and then it was told, no, you can't do that. So therefore, there was external factors affecting what could and could happen at that particular point in time. And that was very much dynamic. And, and the problem then was that if you watch the news, literally the situation was changing on a daily basis. And there's lots of people being interviewed saying, this is going to happen, or I want this to happen. But they don't actually explain why they thought that, or how they were going to make it happen. Lots of wish lists and articulations and people without any much common ground. Therefore, there was a changing, messy, complex landscape. And, and, and really, it was very difficult to make much sense of it at all. And, and you know, as, you know if, if you're a product owner, hopefully your life isn't quite as messy as that. But it gives you a sense of if people want lots of different things, how do you really synthesize that into a plan? So... Um, this diagram, which is too small to see, but that, that, don't worry about that. So the, the gentleman produced a, a, what looks like a bit of a flow chart. And then uh, that allowed me to read that and go, ah, right, I can now see what's going on because there's clear steps. There's parliamentary process involved here. There's knowledge being applied to kind of interpret how you would get to a particular outcome. Um, but it, it's still messy and complicated, but at least I can make a bit more sense of what's really going on here. And um, again, there was no clear strategy, but at least you could understand this is where we're at, this is what could happen next, and if that happens, this makes that outcome more likely and this one less likely. And, and there's branching elements here and there's things that converge. I mean, it did reflect the complexity of what was going on. I was thinking, well, Let's face it, if you can do that for Brexit, we could presumably apply that in a simpler context. But how's that going to work, right? So what I did was I took that diagram, just tilted on its left, and therefore the outcomes were then on the right-hand side, so we had a bit of a timeline. And um, I said, well, of that, of those different outcomes that was on that diagram, you could say that some were more favourable than others. And for a strategy, you would want to move it towards the favourable ones that you wanted, but you would also want to avoid the particularly unfavorable ones and keep clear of that. So it's like, understand what you would want to do, but also understand what the competitions want to do and overlay that. So as a strategy, a bit like playing chess, you're trying to envisage what your competition is going to do to disrupt that before it happens. And often strategies that are PowerPoint decks don't actually show what your opponent's moves are going to do. And as we saw with Blockbuster, it was the opponent that disrupted the business. So unless you have a strategy that shows what your opponent's going to do, it's only going to give you limited information. So um, I took that sideways map and then scored the goals. And then I looked at the different pathways to that outcome. And then I you could then form a plan to say, if this is the outcome we want, this is the pathway we need to follow. And these are the pathways we need to avoid. Now, Agile talks a lot about being reactive and uh, being able to respond to events. Now, that's really useful. It's, it's, it's useful if you couldn't have foreseen the event happening. Obviously, if you could have foreseen the event happening, it's better to plan and be ahead of the competition already. So I see this as proactive agile is thinking ahead to say, this is what could happen. Well, maybe this is the plan B just in case. So we're a bit ready. We've thought ahead. We've got some preparation there. 
like maybe having a pandemic plan, right? So it's there. And, and the reactive is, well, this thing happened and we didn't anticipate it, but now we've got the ability to respond quickly. And both go quite hand in hand. If all you're doing is responding, then you're not setting the agenda. And the companies that end up being successful are the ones that set the agenda. So you want to start moving towards that set the agenda, because if you've got a plan and you're executing it, think about Kinefin, you're executing your product in the complex, the complicated space, because you've got a plan and you're adhering to it and you're responding to small changes. If everyone else is uh, unaware of your plan and they're just responding to events that you are causing, they're more in the complex space because they're having to respond and adapt and sense. Whereas you've got a plan you're executing, because you've got more certainty, you're more likely to succeed. So that was what then came out of that kind of processing. I basically looked at the outcomes on the right, of which was actually about seven. You could see, like, you know, some led to uh, in, uh, stop Brexit, some led to general election, which wasn't really an outcome, some led to different types of deals. You could score them, just go, right, I would prefer to move towards that end of the spectrum. I'd prefer to move away from that end of the spectrum. And then you can see which pathway you need to follow to get the outcome that you want. Now, of course, that, that map there was from April 2019. Now, this map was updated regularly, but for each update, you could then update what you wanted to do next based on that plan. It wasn't a static plan. It changed sometimes a couple of times a week, but it was very useful because it could show you what you needed to do next in order to make it more likely your outcome would succeed. And from that, say, so like supposing you had wanted to revoke Articles 50 or go to a vote again, you could then work backwards from that outcome to say, well, what, what are the steps that lead to that? And I wrote that down on the left. So you could say, here's the strategy, and it's actually twofold. You could do this, or there's a more risky approach that, that does that. And they're both coherent. They make sense. They fit together, and they tell you what to do. Now, if that's not the outcome that you were wanting to go for, you can then say, well, what do we need to change in this map to make that more likely? Um, you know, where are our weak points? What are the competition going to do next? And you can say that if a, a wish list strategy of just do this, well, if the map isn't telling us that's what's going to happen, then we need to do something differently and we should act now rather than wait till it's too late. Because, um, so that's basically what I've just talked through is that those points, if you follow them to the outcomes that you want, that becomes your roadmap. And then you can see what you would do, what your opponents might do. And, and that's, that's key for a business strategy is envisaging what your opponents might do and when. And then the points, I would call them reflection points, these little bits in the map of key things happening, where things could change drastically. You can update the roadmap then to see, do we need an updated plan? And that way it's consistent with, with current reality. Now, the point at the bottom is, things aren't going your way, maybe you do need a different strategy, and this points it out sooner rather than later. Because in the case of Brexit, the two parties that had a poor strategy, we see because they came up poorly in the general election and didn't get what they wanted, is the Liberal Democrats and Labour. Both of them lost their leader. And I could see that actually their strategy was based around wishful thinking rather than we believe this, and this is our plan for successfully executing it. The, the two parties that had particularly good strategies, one was the Conservative Party that won, but also the SNP, which picked up a large number of seats, actually had coherent plans to say, this is what we're going to do, this is why we're going to do it, and this is why we're, we're executing this now. So again, a wish list isn't a strategy. You need to actually have a, a believable plan that makes it reality. Now, looking back on this, now we can tell now how it all turned out, but actually this map was produced in real time. And you can see it on Twitter, and the tweets are there going back to March 2019. So over a span of nine months, these plans were produced. You can see them. You can go back in time and see what they predicted. It didn't predict the whole nine months. It only predicted it to a reasonable horizon. Otherwise, like predicting the path of a hurricane, became too messy. Right, so plan to a realistic horizon, and then say, this is what we do. And each series of the map, correctly predicted what would happen next. Now imagine you take that to business. In business, you're maybe not dealing with things that are changing every day, but imagine I could come there with a tool and say, I can tell you what's going to happen in the future with a high degree of reliability. Imagine how valuable that would be. So, so that was the, 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 the reverse data. And I just went, it's astonishing that something that complex was actually that predictable and it happened. 
but but largely it was ignored by the UK media. The, the foreign media really uh, feasted on this, and the Trump became like a huge Twitter celebrity, based on the fact that everybody found it really useful to understand what was happening. Because they could understand what was happening, then report on it more analytically and explain it to people. But but for whatever reason, the British press just messed out in that and just said, well, let's do some vox pops and get four different opinions. It doesn't really help us to understand. It just tells us what people are wanting. So that's the kind of walking through of the complex example with, with Brexit. Uh, but, but, but taking it back to making it simpler for the agile world. Um, I then, so out of that, uh, break the diagram, I devised a simple template. So just to talk you through how this works is that it's a timeline. So you're moving from left to right as time, but also the top bottom like that uh, break the diagram is there's, there's outcomes and you're scoring things in relation to your outcomes. So it's a position of increasing advantages on the y-axis. So of course with strategy, you want to move to a position of advantage. This makes it visible. The left-hand side where it's yellow is your context. So this is the problem you're really trying to solve just now. And this is the things you need to work with just now, such that you see that the next move then makes sense. And on the right-hand side, you've got your outcomes, which is where you're trying to head towards, and your vision, which is your end state. Also importantly, at the bottom right, you're envisaging where your opponents might be wanting to take you to because it's an advantage for them. So you're envisaging both good and bad. So you're seeing you're moving away from the bad, you're moving towards the good. Now, the, the middle bit is really where the action happens, and there's five areas there. And the reason is that I think of this a bit like a game of football or rugby or whatever sport you to get to choose. But, but if you think about watching these games, they often give you analytics at half time about who had the possession or, or, or you know, where was the field of play or what was all going on. I mean, that's useful because it's a predictor. If most of the action is in your opponent's half, it's likely that you're in control, it's more likely you're gonna score. Right? But just being in possession is not enough. You need to score in order to win. But it's a predictor of success, is if you don't get into your opponent's half at all, you're not gonna win. Um, and so what I saw this as, as what you might call tactical advantage, or, or in safe, these would be called enablers. So like building DevOps doesn't win you the, the game, but it provides a platform on which you can then put products out quicker to customers. And then that's the embedded gain, which is you have launched the product. It's now giving you revenue. And because it's now launched, the landscape has now changed. This is like launching the iPad or the iPhone. It's out, people can see it, but then critically, although it's delivering value for you and your customers, everybody can see that product and now they can copy it. So internal advantage is on this board, as well as external advantage that brings you revenue, but might also change the landscape. So portraying this in this way I felt was useful, and also disadvantaged positions, and also embedded losses. I'll talk you through an example to show how this works in reality. But broadly the... Okay. Yeah. Okay, can we ask a quick question yeah. before going to the next slide? A uh, question from pra Pradam, sorry if I'm not saying that right. Uh, would you recommend building a strategy map from right to left or left to right? In his experience, starting from the right helps his team to think what the outcomes are that they're trying to achieve. Well, well that's, that's a good point. I mean, it's whatever works for you. I mean, we, we walk Kanban boards from right to left. Um, but generally the work or timelines typically go from left to right. We see this in customer journey maps. It's whatever else. I mean, it could go left to right, but you can use the board right to left, like a Kanban board. I mean, just try different stuff and see what works, right? Um, I think that at least making it visible is a huge leap forward over, over everything else that we've done before. But, but broadly, as I've shown in this diagram, the, uh, the intent is you start now and you're moving from a disadvantage position and, and you're being open about that. You're saying, this is the level of disadvantage we're experiencing. Therefore, this is why this matters. And you're moving to the, the future and you're moving to a more advantageous position. So generally, the, the movement on this diagram is from bottom left to top right. But to, to talk you through wh why this matters, right? In this, in the sort of um, uh, peachy colored things, you've got what might be a bit of a roadmap, right? It's like four key stages over a, a, a six to 12 month period, right? 
no, let's roll out some agile. Right? We know that agile rollouts don't always work, so um, this might or might not work, depending on what happens in the next slide. But broadly, you see a roadmap looking a bit like this. It's it's either a connected line or it's a, a bit of a wavy line, but actually means the same thing, right? It doesn't matter if it's wavy or straight. It's still, you'll do this, and then you do that, and then you do that, and then you do that, and then I'll be, I'll be happy, right? But this is what a roadmap might look like. If you plot this on a strategy map, we assume it looks like that. So you start from your disadvantaged position. You're starting to incur some advantage because you've rolled out the new roles. People understand them. They've got a bit of an understanding of product owner and scrum master. You then roll it out and hey, you banked your win, you've ticked your box. HR can move on and, and they've done their bit. And hey, presto, we're now transformed, right? So that's, that's what that... Um, a roadmap might look like on a strategy map, but I think you now begin to visualize something might go wrong here because I mean, actually I was actually there when it happened and this is what led me to, to say, this is maybe not the right way to be doing things. Uh, that's actually what happened, right? So the, 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 um, there was people in existing roles like project manager, they sent out an email before Christmas to say, well, as you're aware, we've been doing Agile for about a year. Um, it's, it's your turn next, by the way. Uh, there'll be product owners and scrum masters and be training available. Uh, people went away over Christmas and worried if they'd be coming back to having a job. Uh, and, and also they'd just done their annual reviews and so all their objectives then got basically um, invalidated because they'd be doing a different line of work. So then fear and distrust set in. And then if you're not careful, that can just lead to entrenched resistance and people not wanting to change or agile being forced on them. And as we see, often it's like middle management particularly don't get it and go, well, hang on a second. This agile stuff is all very well for the business. It's going to put me out of a job. I just go as slow as you like. So this is like what could happen. This is the realism of it all. So this is like what the thought would happen. But this is the reality. And you can clearly see there's a big difference, right? But actually making failure obvious, it helps people to have that discussion. The reality is more like this. So this is where we see a sense of a strategy map as multiple things can happen, which is actually the reality in a complex world. Multiple things can happen. So you've got your old job roles, you bring in a pilot group and you try it out. That could work, but it might not work, right? But if it doesn't work, what are you going to do next? Right, and what's your kind of plan? So this might take a little bit longer, but it's got more assuredness. And you're seeing, well, if things don't quite work out, um, what do we do instead? And you also see that it doesn't just jump magically from the disadvantage to the miraculous, this is all working out with a nice big leap. You go, these big leaps, they're always a bit risky, right? Uh, maybe like over optimism. So let's not make big leaps. Let's do smaller leaps. Let's, let's go to a smaller position of advantage and see what it's like there and then reevaluate. So this is more like reality. And it's painting that things could still fail, but you want to actively counter that path to failure and you want to actively evaluate are you on the path to success? So that's what it could look like for a more simple example. And then how this works in reality is. That's your roadmap. That's the bit in green, right? And there's your plan B in yellow, just in case. But of course, as, as you tried each thing, you would then update this to see is this still relevant or do we need to change or something else happened? So you're now seeing your strategy overall, your why, and your roadmap, and your plan B, and where you expect to be from a position of success for each stage. And it's realistic because it's transparent it's open and people can provide feedback on it. And that's how the Brexit maps worked. They were transparent. And, and if somebody with a particular political level of analysis could say that won't work because, you would get feedback, right? And so he evolved the maps in line with lots of knowledge because he was transparent and open about his working. So this is being transparent and saying, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. Please give us feedback if you disagree. It invites feedback which is one of the things that typically missing in strategies is decided in a closed room and then it's forced on people. And often the people that they call face are doing the work and say, that, that'll never work. But by that point, it's too late because the big boss will lose face and won't look so good. So again, this collaborative strategy approach facilitated by a map will actually lead to better thinking. So there's, a, there's quite a lot of different approaches that support building maps. Now, I don't obviously have time to cover that in this type of talk. I've just touched on some of them here, like pre-mortem, respecting things like Kinefin, 
trying to line the path up and refining it. There's lots of supporting practices, which are just reference here. But above all, it's important about just being open and effective and supporting collaboration and inviting feedback and the wisdom of the crowds. So rather than dwell too much on that, um, that that's obviously a topic in its own right. Um, again, we talk about Kinefin a lot in Agile, and it's about saying for each point in the map, where are you in relation to Kinefin? We make the mistake often that saying Agile is in the complex domain. Well, it isn't the whole time, right? It's actually in that green space, which is slightly complex. But things like DevOps is not necessarily complex. You build it and it works. It's like a factory. You press the button and it's out there. Yeah, it's an automated process. It's complicated. So for each thing that you're doing, just at least consider the level of complicatedness and the level of complexity, because that can guide you as to how unpredictable it's going to be. Um, so again, I talk a little bit more about what you might do in each situation and particularly the more complex you perceive it to be that could lead to multiple outcomes or affect how far ahead you would want to plan um yeah you, you might want to color code it just to um yeah, make it more relevant and again like th thinking about tying these practices in um, rather than just assuming everything's complex you've got to do an experiment well maybe you do but Maybe you don't. It's um, and it's about understanding the effects. So if something could lead to a dramatic bad outcome, then you might want to pay particular attention to the level of complexity there. Um, just touching on strategy maps, as you mentioned before, this is actually a topic that's been around for a while. Um, a leading professor, uh, emeritus professor at Harvard, came up with strategy maps, but this was um, in two thousand. There's a blog article about them there very much in the balanced scorecard approach of, you know, uh, relevant baskets of metrics and the sort of things you should do, but it didn't actually say, um, yeah, it didn't really take into things that have been developed since. I mean, Kinefin wasn't really around there, Agile wasn't really around there, thinking's moved on, but this is a thing that people have been thinking about for a while. Uh, red team thinking has risen in popularity, in particular in the last year, I did a course in it, and it's really sort of becoming more talked about in agile circles. And this is about military thinking in agile context where a mistake is too expensive to recover from. So the military will want to explore options first and say, in battle strategy, how might this plan out first and second order effects and thinking ahead before it's too late. So that's again, a useful practice. Mike Cohn references pre-mortem in his blog uh, last September. Uh, and again, it's, it's about proactively thinking ahead to see how could this pan out. Um, so that's kind of me talking about using the proposal. So we're almost at the end. I've just uh, got a couple of quick sections then we can recap and deal with Q&A. Wardley maps, just come back to that for a minute. Um, they are useful. I'm not going to put them down, but they're, they're actually about visualizing technical maturity against value stream. So they can give you context to work from and say what might happen, but then you need to actually take it into a plan as to say, but what do we need to do first? And how would that apply? So they can guide forming a strategy. And of course, strategy isn't just about technical maturity either, it's a more generic concept. And I see this as just like a way of visualizing moves, like a Kanban board as a way of visualizing work. Um, Simon Ward gives a keynote called Crossing the River by Feeling the Stones, which is about sensing, adapting, and responding. Uh, and I did a map of the river and the stones. So basically that's you crossing the river from here and now to the future um, by sensing and adapting and responding. So it's very much in line with Wardley's thinking, um, uh, even if that's quite a, a messy diagram and shows off my lack of PowerPoint skills. But really it's, it's sort of bringing it together. Um, there's different aspects here. I talked about leadership at the start and that's very much about being proactive, setting the vision, uh, supporting people and leaders are really largely responsible for setting the cultural agenda in a company and saying, you know, making collaboration really work. Agility is about responding to change and also lean is also relevant too. So it's about not just saying it's all about agile, it's about things in context here. And the circle represents just that people touch all of that. So if we lose sight of involving the people, then we'll lose them. Peter Merrill does a lot of work in this area about invite them in and invitational leadership and servant leadership rather than just command and control and comply and um, leader by coercion, which is what some of the leaders are now saying about back to the office of, you know, you're going to come back whether you want to or not. Well, that's not really leadership. That, that's coercion. 
uh, you're being told what to do, whether you like it or not, or whether it's effective or not, and, and the leadership pattern might actually disagree with the data. So uh, a few things to think about, I mean, which are covered largely already, uh, just to kind of uh, sum it up there. Uh, but just to wrap it up with 12 key takeaways and things that you might find uh, that this helps you with. So just over having a to-do list or a PowerPoint deck, uh, using it in this visual way, there's um, what I thought might be 12 different advantages of doing it this way, making it visual over simply making a linear list. Now, not all of those will apply to you, but even if some of them apply, you may be in a better position of reacting early, uh, being collaborative and looking for, you know, what do you do and when do you do it and what your opponents might do? Because as we see before, and not taking account of the competition has often been the biggest downfall of companies. Uh, and, and also for say multiple routes, right? There might be more than one thing to do. So you might then choose to say, well, have this as a plan B, or actually we'll execute both pathways simultaneously because waiting for plan B might be too late. So again, this visual representation is perhaps going to facilitate the right sorts of conversations. Uh, so that's kind of recap and summary, and then just we're on to the last bit now, almost done. There's some uh, books that are referenced, um, uh, Roman Fischler, and some other things that are relevant. Again, I send out the deck so you can have access to all these links. There's a lot of um, useful um, things you can read about there, as well as, well as my uh, contact details. And that second would product delivery mapping was my earlier work on bringing together um, uh, the uh, Wardley work with actually saying, but how do you shape the teams and decide how to uh, get the team uh, teams together from a Wardley map? So it's an earlier version of this talk. And therefore, that's kind of us uh, pretty much at the end. So um, thanks for listening and um, open to questions. And um, I'll leave that up. So that's the talk on a page to help to um, prompt you if you've got any questions about anything <laughs> in the talk, is there just in front of you. Right. Thanks, Craig. We've actually, you've got a lot of uh, good feedback in the chat, good healthy chat while you're presenting. Um, with the folks who've asked questions and we've held to the end, I think, Mike, you're up first. If you want to come off mute and on camera, then David, you'll be second up. Um, Peter, if you, if you want to uh, share your comments, you can be third and Femi fourth if that's okay. Hi, Craig. Thanks again Hi. for the session. It's great. Um, so, so looking at strategies and especially the feedback loop, which I see is almost the most critical part of a yeah. strategy. Mm -hmm. My question was this. So the feedback loop for a strategy is often stopped or diluted because bad news makes people look bad. Yeah. How do you overcome this blurring of the feedback? Well, of course, there's, that ties into the whole psychological safety. Is it okay to speak up? You know, um, now, as much as possible, you want to be that inclusive leader who's willing to listen to alternative views. And there be, there's obviously good leaders and bad leaders, and there's people that like listening to the sound of their own voice. Uh, but, but ultimately, if they don't take on the feedback, ultimately they're making it more likely you'll fail. So it's better, you know, in the world of Agile, if you're really embracing Agile sensibly, the team has that feedback at the retro. You know, feedback is critical in Agile. And it, it's not necessarily, a, I would, wouldn't really paint it as bad news. I'd just say, look, I mean, people talk about fail fast. I, I prefer the term learn fast. And, 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 and the, the bad news comes if you don't learn fast. So again, a lot of this kind of always boils down to like executive coaching or, or coaches working with leaders in the right way to say, well, in this world of complexity, right, where there's different tactics to succeed, if things don't work out, well, that's to be expected sometimes because that's the nature of the world we live in. Like you have experiments, some of them don't work out. We see this with the COVID vaccines, right? Some go to market sooner and some didn't work out, right? Whatever, that's just life. That's, that's being in a complex world. Don't think of it as a negative. Think of it as you're doing the right things to succeed and out of the way you're approaching it, some things will work and some things will don't. But if you don't experiment, you don't learn. Um, I mean, a lot of this is, is I mean, this is like a, the cultural mindset shift. And it's about leaders willing to accept ideas other than their own. And as a coach, it's like, you know, I sort of work with leaders to make it think it was their idea to say, but have you considered this? Or if, let's, let's just work that through and see how that could pan out. And a lot of this is just trying to foresee 
first and second order events so that you know all leaders want to succeed. And if you're pointing out something that would fail before it fails, then you become that trusted advisor that they rely on so that they don't fail as often. Yeah, so I certainly buy into that. I guess what I see often is that a lot of middle managers get evaluated on good news yeah. and seem to feel that they shouldn't give bad news because it's a reflection on them. And so what can we as leaders do to say to them, actually, showing bad news is critical in, yeah. in our attempt to, to succeed. And in fact, I often say that if senior leaders can expose their own failures, they often encourage yeah. other people to expose. Yeah, well, bad news now is better than catastrophic news later, right? So it's like, think of it as an opportunity. And of course, this emotional vulnerability is a real critical thing in a great leader. Not, not everybody's got it, and it's a real skill. Right? And particularly leaders that are now at the top of organisations, they were learning back in the 70s and 80s, typically, when it was a different type of landscape. So it is a shift. But it's about trying to sort of support them on that journey in the right way to say, well, if some, somebody calls something out, look at it constructively that it might actually make you more successful in the long term, even if it seems like a difficult situation to deal with now. Yeah, 100% agree. Thank you for your answers. More than okay. happy to over to the next. Thanks, David, I think you're up. Hello, um, great session, thanks, Craig. Uh, Craig, quick question, you mentioned, um, you mentioned company vision somewhere earlier on, and it always strikes me when I go to various gigs that, Companies don't seem to have vision. Uh, yeah. occasionally, occasionally I see some that are perfect, but in general, the majority um, really has a poor sense of vision, which obviously drives the strategy. So I was just wondering what kind of approaches you take, or if you have some samples of good um, visions, um, and that would be helpful. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. I mean, vision's critical, but because vision is the driver for, for why do you exist as a company? Yeah, and, and Simon Sinek talks a lot about this, so rather than covering his thoughts, he just says, well, a lot of companies might say making money or satisfying customers, well, actually making money is a side effect of being successful. Like, mm -hmm. You've still got to think about why do you exist. Now, successful companies tend to have clear visions. You know, like Google wants the, the, all the world's information to be one click away. So therefore, because it's got that vision, the mission that it does, which is organise the world's information, then makes sense. So therefore, if they then agree the mission, everything that they're doing is then about contributing to that mission, which then makes the vision more realistic. Now, right. certain, certain, I mean, and the vision should be compelling and, and useful, really, rather than just uh, waffle words. It should be something that's actually relevant to your business. Because even if, you know, Google doesn't meet that, you know, it's still a, a, a huge company worth like hundreds of billions of dollars. So even if you don't reach that vision, it sets kind of like the North Star, so everybody's heading in the right direction, in the same direction. So vision might not necessarily be something you actually make happen, but it's something that you're heading towards to, to provide that common purpose so people are aligned. That's a, a good answer. I um, certainly agree with that. Uh, can I just ask a quick secondary yeah. um, question towards that? What is a good technique to create a vision? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's somewhat tough, but it's like asking that difficult question back to the executive to say, but, but why do you exist as a company? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you may well then almost, it depends. I mean, if the company's old, you might not want, want, not want to go back to the founding values. But actually, if it's lasted a long time, perhaps the founding values are still relevant to say, you know, like the trustee savings bank was set up and I think the 18th century to to provide readily accessible savings and that long narrative may really resonate still in the modern day you know i mean okay nokia started out as being a fish processing factory maybe that's not quite so relevant but it's like <laughs> what what is your narrative as a story as a story as an organization what part of that origin story is still relevant now where do you sort of see perhaps the market going in the future but it, it's it's like you know, if you look at things like Apple's vision, it's almost like, you know, and their and their the why of existence, it's like we want to challenge the world and be different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to, to this is our sort of driving our thinking and driving our, our way of approaching problems. Therefore, this is why we do what we do. And actually we see, I mean, Simon talks about this in, uh, a lot, and it's like, say, I mean, I, I happen to quite like Android, but, but when you compare the launch of a, a new iPhone 
back in the day when we could queue outside shops, it was almost like people were just really, really kind of um, so emotionally bought into the Apple experience in a way that didn't really happen with Android. I mean, remember, Apple nearly went out of business in the early 90s. And it became this organization that people are so passionate about that even if their products are just pretty much as good as anything that Samsung puts out in many regards, they're quite comparable. People have that strong emotional connection to Apple that doesn't really exist to the same extent in other products. So think about a vision that really drives that emotional engagement because Daniel Kahneman talks about type one, type two thinking. So type one is kind of your more basic emotional thought. If you can tap into that, it drives a lot of what's going on in the type two brain of rational thought. It sets that landscape. So if you drive that emotional connection, it actually dominates the processing part of the brain. So therefore, um, you've really got that much more stronger brand loyalty and customer loyalty that is going to um, make kind of feature differentiators be less less important. I mean, actually, I've touched on the blockbuster example. A lot of that things, um, companies go bust. I mean, I, I sort of say, well, blockbuster went bust because of um, Netflix. Actually, you can probe a little bit deeper there and say, although Netflix did disrupt them, why was that? And people say, ah, but Blockbuster had late, late fees and Netflix didn't. Yeah, but then think about what happened. People didn't like late fees. People worried about late fees. Netflix took that worry away. It was mm. an emotional decision that then led to a transactional change, which then led to Blockbuster being put out of action. Netflix, without perhaps articulating it, led through emotionally led decisions because they took away the worry. They took away the concern. They took away the things that people didn't like. It was emotionally led. And you see a lot of these big shifts. It's about understanding what people's emotions are that then drives their behavior and what they want. And therefore, when you connect the emotional behavior to the customer behavior, you can then you know, see where a vision could emerge that lines up genuinely with what people are are actually really uh, driven by for emotional reasons. That's wonderful. Um, excellent answer. Thank you very much, Greg. Who was next on the... I've got a question. I don't know if, uh, if I'm jumping the queue. I don't know if it's, uh, our facilitator was uh, managing the queue. I don't know if she's gone just now. I think I was. I think I was uh, next. Okay. okay. Um, so on um, that closing comment, Craig, in your fantastic presentation, uh, which is very detailed, um, it made me chuckle. It's more of a sarcastic comment than anything yeah. else. Strategy as an ongoing collaboration, yeah. and I just put some comment there that uh, leadership comp they keep the formulation of, st of strategy and executing it to themselves. Yeah. Um, they start natural divide us and them. Yeah. So they come up with strategy in the ivory tower, the things they think will happen, and just pass it down, you know, through that process of strategy, roadmap, product, and then and then they expect it to magically happen yeah. without actually having that dialogue, that collaborative approach. And this is one of the things that causes um some transformations Sorry, to fire. Interrupt, uh, Femi. I have to interrupt Craig and ask him to yeah. readmit, uh, readmit uh, Ashley because she got kicked out. Oh, oh okay. Uh, All right. I don't know how to do he, that. He's, he's trying to get in. Um, how do you? I don't know how you do that. Um, who's the co-host? Uh, I, I am. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to see. Is she in the waiting room? Oh, there she is. Yeah. Ah. All right. right. Sorry, Femi. You can go ahead. No, no, uh, at okay, all. Okay, that's it. Right. Um, I think it was a moral. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's so, a fair point, right? Yeah. So, um, that, and, and you're right, and that's a problem. Now, interestingly, you know, when we do natural transformation, so you want to be an agile organization, a lot of that agility is about breaking down silos. So, we don't have a dev team and a test team. We break down the silos and put them together. Guess what? Management's a silo too, right? So, if you think that silos are just for the bottom part of the organization, you're wrong because if management has a silo, that's just another problem to be solved. And, and where things like OKRs work is they make that transparent from top to bottom. So you can see what the management thinking is. You can see what works in, you know, and it cascades down. But an important thing about OKRs, which I'm a big advocate of, is that Google says that a lot of it is 80% moving upwards. 
So you're not just getting the leadership saying, this is what you're doing, this is why you're going to do it. You're, you're basing that your, your decisions a lot on the knowledge that's emerging upwards too. So, you know, leadership needs to recognize it's a silo and silo decision making often typically made by people in the 40s, 50s or 60s that might go into certain schools or maybe white males is very narrow thinking. And, and organizations are talking all the time about diversity and more women on boards or disabled people or different ethnic backgrounds. Fantastic. Because guess what? That That's not only great for, for equality, it's great for diversity of thought. One of the things we saw at the Agile 20 Reflect Festival in February is, you know, although it may well have been 17 white blokes in a room that wrote the Agile Manifesto, in, in February we had people doing Agile in Africa or in South America. We had people speaking Russian and sign language saying agility for mothers. All that diversity of thought is out there, and if you can start to harness it, you'll get all these different dice perspectives beyond the sort of middle class male that went to a privileged school and rose to the top of the organization. You're, you're drawing on that extra knowledge, as well as, of course, addressing all the inequalities. But it's, it's what we really want is diversity of thought, and then you get better perspectives. Thank you. Uh, and all, Hi, Ashley. Uh, Hi, you back? sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but if there was chat in the last few minutes, I completely missed yeah. it. So I'm not sure if anyone else had a question. I think there was an IT Labs, and I can't remember what you changed your name to. I'm so sorry. I changed, I, yeah, I changed my name by default uh, from IT <laughs> Labs. To okay. Did you have a chance to ask yet? Yeah. So um, I, it's more of a kind of really basic question is, is that, I mean, to me, visualizing anything is just important human beings are visual creatures huge parts of our brain are dedicated to it. so how the hell did we get to a situation where visualization is an innov innovation i just can't yeah. believe it's taken that long sorry i'm getting uh -huh. passionate about it because well, it is my, my other talk is actually about visualization because as somebody who appreciates visualization of course we use it a lot in agile and seeing things we can take in more information i also struggled a little bit with going to conferences and a lot of the content was just somebody talking and going yeah. but where's the story going to go next or what have you said or where are we at in the deck or what's the narrative here because when I looked at how Ted say how to do a talk they say tell a story absolutely right? and bring people on that story journey and so I said well if I could visualize the story it'll bring people in so visualization is critical and of course as, as coaches and scrum masters are like the more we can visualize the more we can actually see really what's going on rather than just a narrow bit of a PowerPoint yes. deck or a, or a Word document. It's like actually telling the narrative in a more subtle yeah. and, and understandable way. Picture That's paints right. a thousand words, right? And so, so what, how did, why do you think that came about? Um, that we kind of lost this ability to visualize and then we kind of created all these, you know, strengths, you know, uh, weaknesses, charts, they all look yeah. great, very complex, lots of words. I mean, you know, it's just, I don't know, we've kind of gone down a rabbit hole and I think we've kind of lost why we... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, I, I sort of looking back, I mean, the, the whole arguments about back to the office and body language and all that sort of stuff, I mean, well, where were you in the 1990s when we outsourced and offshored and all we had was email and the telephone and we couldn't <laughs> see people and we couldn't hear what the, their tone of voice. Mm -hmm. like, a lot of, think back to where a lot of management thinking came from in the 70s and 80s, where it was email, we might not even have had PowerPoint, Kanban boards were just post-its on a wall. I, and really... We've evolved the, and understood better the impact of visualization. We have better tools now. I mean, I'm just stuck with PowerPoint here. You could perhaps even turn this into a sort of Kanban board, uh, not, not like portfolio, but just to represent it. But I think we've got such a better appreciation of visualization and why it matters, as well as tools to support that. The, the two have really evolved very much in the last 20 years. But you think when a lot of management thinking comes out of dry decks, long word documents and emails. That's the culture we had to deal with that was very much dominant. And what we're yeah. trying to do is just break that down. Yeah, that's great. I, I just as a plug for a tool which I have no links to, Lucid Charts, I always yeah. kick that up and, and uh -huh. share visualizations and people collaborate on it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's a breath of fresh air to hear yeah. somebody talking about visualizing stuff because it's a battle I've been fighting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm still fighting. Even when you show people visualizations, they want to see it in a Word document or they yeah. want to see it in a bloody PowerPoint, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, even Microsoft's recognizing that PowerPoint, I mean, I'm now using Sway, which is like PowerPoint, but much more dynamic. And, and there are other alternatives out there um, besides PowerPoint. But a lot of, I mean, I see this a lot of organizations are dominated by PowerPoint. And the issue with PowerPoint is it's a bit static. 
uh, you know, before, until quite recently, only one person could edit at a time, which then yeah. limited how it could be updated. You know, yeah. same with Excel. These tools were not really designed for full team collaboration. They are much better at it now, but the legacy of the past is so dominating how we use them. Brilliant. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, uh, we've got time for two more, so please, no more questions after this. Um, Maru, thanks for putting your hand up. You're up first. And then last, but by no means least, Neil, you're up. You're up last Q&A for the night. Thanks. Maru, are you happy to come off mute? Or if you want to type, I can ask your question for you. Okay, Neil, why don't you why don't you go ahead first, if that's okay? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Hi, Craig. Really interesting. Really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, just a thought on the difference between a good strategy and an agile strategy, mm -hmm. and just how that relates to the organisation and how it might implement what you can see in the visualisation. Uh, well, I mean, there's a sort of said that the agile is about this proactive agility. It's planning at a high enough level, as well as incorporating the reactive element. And I'd say like a good strategy is the one that actually on the right-hand side would take you to good outcomes and say, you know, but why do you exist? What's the purpose you're trying to achieve here? And and the kind of good strategy is, I suppose it's got that good direction that you want to move and that actually clearly articulated people to buy into it. The agile strategy is incorporating the right level of optionality because if you're in a fairly predictive landscape, you might not need so many options. But I'd say that the key here is, you know, at each, each of the stages, just reflect and adapt and be transparent, incorporate diversity of thinking and use the wisdom of the organization as much as possible rather than create a silo. So as much of this is about how do you do it rather mm -hmm. than the strategy itself? Because if you have a poor strategy, it's better to find that out sooner rather than later. And you'll find that out sooner by being more transparent about it and inviting feedback. Because there's lots of people maybe straight out of university or have different experience could say, but have you thought about this? And and really what I'm trying to get here is about being transparent, open and visual and collaborative in order then, I mean, this isn't going to guarantee success, but it's going to address a lot of the problems that lead to failure. So it's much, it's, it's like saying, have you got a good Kanban board? Well, it's, it's more about how you use it that really counts, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really like that. I think that's a view of the how and how important that is. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks, Ashley. Cheers. Maru, are you back? No. Okay. Uh, on that note, it, okay, if anyone has a 30 second question, <laughs> you can ask. But I think we're actually, I think, I think we've gone through them all. So Craig, listen, thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think I can speak on behalf of all the participants tonight and say we thoroughly enjoyed this talk. There's a lot of good feedback in the chat, some great questions. You've given us a lot to think through and think, how can we help our companies and clients visualize their strategies better? So just for those that asked, um, we will be sharing the slides in the recording. Just to let you know, we have a new Agility Leadership Network YouTube channel. Um, and Craig will, uh, I'm not sure if you want to share the link or I can share it back through the meetup group of those who attended. Uh, directly, but either way, we'll get them out to you. Um, for what's coming up next, you are all in luck. We are giving you a month's break from our fortnightly Tuesday night sessions. So please enjoy the pub and some sunshine. Don't forget your uh, sunblock. Melanoma is the number one most preventable disease, as my sister always reminds me, at least in the US it is. Uh, when we come back in July, the first Tuesday of the month, we've got open mic night, Giles and myself, um, and all of your wonderful selves, just hope those Q and A, um, open mic, ask questions, answer questions. And then the third week of the third Tuesday of July, we have leading and transforming with outcomes with Mike Burroughs. So Craig, thank you so much again. This is absolutely brilliant. Well, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for all the feedback. And it's good to get these questions. It's really good conversation that was going there with all the Q&A. Great. Okay. Thank you all. See you Thanks. all next time. Bye. Craig, can I ask you to stop recording since I lost the power? Uh, <laughs> okay.
Do you see the button anywhere? Uh, 